I'm Becky Durham. I'm the pastor of Peace Presbyterian Church, and this is the Sunday sermon for the seventh Sunday of Easter Tide. As we prepare to read and hear from God's word, please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes and open our ears that we would hear what you say to us this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Listen now for the word of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, but it's also Ascension Sunday, the day that we remember Jesus's return to heaven to reign and rule for all eternity as our resurrected king. Another passage that we will read in the worship service this morning comes from Acts 1, and it tells of Jesus crucified, dead, and buried and then raised from the dead, and how he spent 40 more days with his disciples, helping them to understand everything that this meant. The resurrection changed everything. Acts 1-3 says, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And then he promised them that just as John baptized them with water, they would soon be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit would empower them to be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then Jesus, their rabbi, guide, friend, and revelation of God ascended into heaven and left them to continue his mission. And they did it. We spent all of ordinary time last year between Pentecost and Advent, reading and considering the book of Acts together, walking with Jesus's first followers and other early apostles as they learned how to be disciples on the move, carrying the gospel like Jesus taught them, except on a much larger scale with congregations being gathered, not only in Capernaum and Jerusalem, but in all of Judea and Samaria, and then in places like Philippi and Athens and Ephesus, where the author of our letter, John, planted churches and pastored them. Perhaps six decades passed between the time Jesus ascended into heaven and the time that John wrote this letter. 
perhaps three decades passed between the time the events in the last chapter of the book of Acts and the writing of this letter. During those decades, power changed hands. Rome burned, the temple was destroyed, the church went underground into hiding, and they began to face persecution. Most of Jesus's first disciples and many church leaders were jailed or martyred during those decades. But some things had not changed. And John writes this letter to remind his church about what has always been true. Things that Jesus taught them, things that John had written about in his gospel. The words of this letter are words written by a disciple to a church that's been through a host of challenges and an ever-shifting cultural landscape. He's going to remind them of the things that have not changed, of the things that have always been true. And perhaps for those of us who have been through some challenges and shifts, as a church and as disciples, his words will also remind us of what has always been true. The things that do not change even when it seems that everything else does. This is our fifth and final week in 1 John. And when we began, I told you that I thought it was timely to share this letter together now. John writes a letter filled with truths about belonging, about overcoming, and about living that we share with disciples in every time and place, and that we remember together on this day when we have gathered in this space. And when we remember that we are also gathered at the font as we remember our baptized life together. The first thing that has always been true is this. We are the family of God. We are the family of God. Verse one, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. When we believe that Jesus is the Christ, when we profess our faith in Jesus as Savior, and when we submit to him in obedience as Lord, turning from sin, renouncing evil and its power in the world, we are those born of God. This is not a physical birth. It's a spiritual birth. To be born of God through faith means that we are children of God and members of God's family together siblings and heirs of Jesus, the only begotten son from all of eternity. And John has told us what it is to be a member of this family. Remember his five word sermon, little children love one another. Our love for one another is commanded by Jesus, and it's a sign that we are born of God and members of God's family. If you love the parent, you love the child, John says. If you love God, you love everyone born of God. And if you've been keeping up with John in this letter, you know that he doesn't mean say it. He doesn't mean think it. He means what? He means do it, actually love the ones born of God. Father Gustavo Gutierrez, a liberation theologian from Peru said this, so you say you love the poor? Name them, name them. It's one thing to say the words, it's another thing to do it, actually loving people that you know by name. Here John says to us, you say you love God's children, name them. For true obedience comes in the action of loving in the cracks and in the corners, around the hard edges, through the messy middle. It can be easy to love strangers. It can be hard to love people that you can name. I would guess you already know that. Verse three, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. The commandment to love one another, it's not given as a hardship or a burden and so that, or so that God can punish us if we don't do it well enough. God's commandments are not meant to be gotcha opportunities. 
our confirmation class learned a couple of weeks ago that the commandments are a mirror, a guard, and a guide graciously given by God. A mirror that shows us who we are, a guard so that we will not stray from being as God calls us, and a guide that leads us to abundant life. This commandment to love one another is given because this is how God intends for us to live and God's will and way bring freedom and abundant life. When we love one another, we are filled with God's perfect love and the spirit testifies to God's goodness from within us. We are created, gathered, and called to be a family of faith, loved by God and loved by one another. This has always been true. We belong to God and we belong to one another. Second thing that's always been true, we overcome by faith. We overcome by faith. Verse four, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith, who is it that conquers the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, on the night that he was arrested, said to his disciples, in this world, you will face trouble. But fear not, I have overcome the world. We must remember that Jesus announced his overcoming of the world as he was headed to his last hour filled with trouble. As he was about to face death, his overcoming was not a shortcut or a detour around trouble, and neither will ours be. We who are born of God and called Jesus Savior and Lord participate in the ongoing life of Jesus in the world, seeking to overcome brokenness and evil. When we stand at the font and we reaffirm our desire and our intent to turn from sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, we join Jesus in this victorious overcoming life. It's not a life that ignores evil or sidesteps evil. It's a life that recognizes it, renounces it, and overcomes it. Verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. Jesus, who was filled with the Holy Spirit in the waters of his baptism, and Jesus, who laid down his power and submitted even unto a bloody death. In the death and new life of Jesus, God's love has been revealed, and God's love has overcome all possible opposition. Pastor and theologian Brian Peterson writes, this overcoming of the world is not a profound fable or inspiring mythology, but is reality made concrete in the community of the church as God's love overcomes the divisions, animosities, and death that the world would promote. Those who believe have overcome the world because their life, love, and identity are not determined by the deceptions of the world, but by the object of their faith, Jesus as the son who was crucified and raised, end quote. We who are God's family overcome by the love revealed to us in Jesus Christ. The third thing that's always been true Whoever has faith has life. Whoever has faith has life. Verse 10, those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The story goes that a Sunday school teacher asked one of her young students, what is the first thing you need to do to go to heaven? And without missing a beat, the boy replied, die. <laughs> you have to die. We think about eternal life as being life after death, heaven. 
But when John writes about eternal life or simply life, John uses both of these phrases interchangeably. He's not writing only about life after death. John is writing about life that starts right now and extends into eternity. Life abundant is another way that he puts it. Life not meant to be lived after, but lived now fully and abundantly. Can you imagine that with me? What does it look like if we are not primarily focused on the destination of our immortal soul, but rather focused on living Jesus's abundant and everlasting life right now while we are still here? What if the church committed to being a foretaste of the kingdom of heaven, demonstrating how God intends us to live and love forever right here and now? What do you imagine that would be like? The third question in our profession of faith as disciples of Jesus asks us if we will be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love. And we profess together that we will with God's help. This question seems so simple and mild, maybe two broad categories for simplification, obedience and love. But this is a question that contains multitudes. When we live into this call, when we strive to obey God's word and show God's love, remember obeying because of the great gratitude we experience as one to have been claimed and called and loved by God so fully and perfectly. We are living the abundant life that John imagined for the church of Jesus. The life that he learned to live at the feet of Jesus, a life that is filled with love and joy and peace with God and peace with one another. Verse 12, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. This is a life for all who have faith in Jesus Christ, God's son. I don't think that John intends this to be a declaration about heaven or hell. If you have Jesus, you're heaven bound. If you don't, you have, if you don't have Jesus, you aren't. I think John would say that's a discussion for another day. The life that he's writing about is that abundant life, the life that comes by faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an abiding life, right? When we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us, when we are able to live life as God intended, a life that is abundant and free, a life that is obedient and loving. That's why when you have the son, you have life because you are abiding one with another. A life that creates a family where all belong and are loved better than they are loved anywhere else. A life that overcomes even in the midst of trouble and persecution and grief. A life that is ours to live right now with one another before God. Verse 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Don't miss it. You have everything you need to live this life right now. In the world, there's all kinds of trouble and change and disappointment. But Jesus has overcome the world and you are overcomers too. These last 14 months, we've been a church that has been seeking to live abundantly together. Your leaders have navigated these troubled waters with imagination and love, seeking new ways to worship and fellowship and learn and love together. And what we found again and again is that abundant eternal life is not about a physical location. It's not about a particular hour on Sunday morning. It's not about a bulletin or a particular worship format. It happens whenever and wherever the spirit is. It happens as we profess our faith again and again, claiming Jesus as our Lord and Savior and claiming one another as we become family, willing to join in the work of overcoming sin and evil in the world and committing to obedience and love, not only in word, but in action. 
if it feels like so much has changed, we remember that these are the things that have always been true. We stand together in those truths and we testify to the goodness of God. Please pray with me. All glory and honor and power are yours, almighty God. May the words of scripture and the testimony of your son challenge us to be more and more like the church you intend us to be. As we have gathered at the font this morning, remind us what it means that we are your disciples, created, claimed, and called by you. And help us to claim one another as family, to renounce evil and overcome it together, and to become a foretaste of your kingdom here on earth. We will with your help. Alleluia. Amen. And now may God bless you and keep you this day and always. Amen.